Lindsay Chapel, if you would, take out your hymn book. Turn to hymn number 213. Hymn number 213. Let's stand for a second.
turning to hymn number 405, Have Faith in God. Just remember back in the back, there's a place if you'd like to give your tithe and offering, and the Lord loves cheerful giving. Amen. Let's stand as we sing hymn number five, 405, 405, Have Faith in God. <laughs>
Colossians chapter 4. And uh, I will say that I had studied primarily in, in Ephesians this week and our Sunday school material. I know some of you have not availed yourself of the Sunday school hour. In the last probably two months, we've rotated probably five or six different teachers. And I just can't tell you how blessed... I've been to hear different men in our church yeah. stand up and teach. It's been really a blessing. And we uh, have cut, we, even today, Chet uh, basically preached my message this morning, a lot of it, and um, which was odd because I knew what the quarterly was aiming for, so I don't know how he got on the topic of redeeming time when he was supposed to be on, you know, spiritual warfare. But uh, this morning I want to preach on... Uh, really a topic, Colossians chapter 4 will be kind of our springboard, and I was going to use Ephesians 5.16, it's a parallel passage, but I would like to just have us as a church body ponder this, and it is what is our time worth? What, what is our time worth? And on that note, what is the most valuable commodity that God has given to us? I believe that scripturally speaking, um, this life that God's given us is made up of time. Um, we have a, a preacher friend named Gary Hawkins who one time said this. I don't know if it was original to him, but I heard him say that we are given time when we are given life. And therefore, killing time is simply slow suicide. Killing time. It's just killing off your life. And I thought that was very poignant. So Colossians chapter 4, I'll start in verse 2. He says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all praying also for us that God would open to us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and praise you. God, I thank you for your word and I thank you this morning that you're with us, Lord, your Word says that, uh, Lord, you're, you're, you inhabit the praise of your people, that where two or more of us are gathered, you're there. And God, we claim that this morning. We want to meet under your name. And, and Lord, we want you to speak to our hearts, God, as um, there's very little that I could say that would help anybody. But, Lord, we know that your word is timeless and your Holy Spirit, uh, Lord, is with us, And so we ask now as a body, my brothers and sisters in Christ that are here, that we corporately would be encouraged and edified. Lord, help us to be built up and better equipped for the work of the ministry that you've given us. God, I pray that if someone here is not saved, while this message is aimed at those of us that are saved, if someone here has never trusted Christ, I pray that this morning your Holy Spirit would do that work in their heart. They would trust you. And be saved is our prayer. And above all, we want you to be exalted, lifted up, and glorified this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. What is our time worth? Now, as we read in Colossians chapter 4, and then I will flip over to Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul said in verse 15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. I don't know if anybody was impressed that Chet, unbeknownst to me, asked me for the definition of circumspectly. And if you break the word down, and I, I gave him a definition because I was already had the definition written down in my notes. <laughs> but it means to be alert, to be attentive, to walk and be paying attention. Paul in Ephesians is writing just like in Colossians, and you'll find this in Paul's letters, he begins the, his church letters, those epistles written to the churches, addressing, uh, and letting us know who he's writing to, addressing believers. And he gives us doctrine, he gives us a lot of foundational, uh, basically, he gives us the indicative, what we should know, before he moves to the imperative, what we should do. So he gives us, a doctrinal base, and if you're not familiar with Ephesians or Colossians for that matter, uh, it's important to know that we're saved by the grace of God. It's a gift, and we are saved unto good works, Ephesians chapter 2 says. But we are saved simply by what Christ has done, not by what we do. We've been placed in Christ. When we receive Christ by faith, 
we become a part of his body. But in every one of Paul's letters, as he gets to the end, he gives practical what you're supposed to do about what you know. What you're supposed to do based on who you are. And that's where we find ourselves in both of these letters. And to, to this morning, today, I want to focus on this phrase, redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. Time is a commodity, as I mentioned. Psalms 31, verse 15, the psalmist David said, My times are in thy hand. Time is short. Many of us are familiar with the idea of life being brief. The Bible says in James it's even a vapor. I mean, this last week a neighbor of mine passed away. Now, they had sent him home, but a month ago he was building a ramp that he planned on using in front of his house. And he used it, I think, four times. Twice he was coming down it on a stretcher. Life is a vapor. We didn't, we didn't know that that's how short his time would be. Life is brief. There's some quotes that, that I had pulled up. I, and most of us have maybe heard this. All of us are given time. Yesterday is gone. It is past. Tomorrow is not promised. It is the future and today is your gift. That's why it's the present. I thought that was kind of cool, but we have today. That's what we've been given. We all have the same amount of time. We're all given a certain quantity today of time. When I say that, you may say, well, not everybody lives the same amount of time, and that's true. But you know that every day we are given 86,400 seconds. And you may have heard this, but I was challenged when I thought about this. What if seconds were cents? What if seconds were cents? Like pennies. You would get $864 a day. How would you spend that account? If you knew that every night your balance would be zeroed out. But instantly... The next morning, it would be filled once again with $864. You could not carry any saved time into the next day. Your account would only have $864 every day, but it was yours to use however you want. If you chose to do nothing, you would lose it. If you chose to invest it, those investments would be however valuable you chose, what, whatever it is that you chose to invest in. A man named Harvey Mackey said, time is free, but it is priceless. You, can, you can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. And once you've lost it, you can never get it back. Wow. Lost time is never found again. Benjamin Franklin said that. Many of us have heard the little phrase, carpe diem, seize the day. Because the fact is, even people that are not saved and and especially those of us that are saved that realize that we are living in light of eternity, how much more valuable should time be to us when we know that we can invest in eternity if we choose to. Right. We can take that which God has given us and we can use it for something that will last. Time is a blessing. It's a commodity that's given to us. And time is short. Uh, this verse, redeeming the time, it references not just the commodity of time, but the brevity of time. It is fleeting. Once it's gone, it's gone. So therefore, time should be seen as valuable. First Chronicles 29.15, the Bible says that our days on the earth are as a shadow. We are strangers before the sojourners, the Bible says. And our days on earth are as a shadow. Job 7, 6, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Job 9, he said, my days are swifter than a post. And that meant a, uh, how many of y'all remember the days of the Pony Express? Post was somebody that carried a message. You see them coming, they deliver, or they just go by, and then the cloud of dust, they're gone. Psalms 39, 5, the psalmist said, Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, and mine ages as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Once again, James 4, 14. What is your life? It is even a vapor. Listen, this isn't intended to be depressing by any means. 
But it is sobering, isn't it? You know what I realize? I realize now that I'm 41 that the, the further you go in time, the faster it moves. Amen? They call it topping a hill. Well, I don't know if, I don't know if, uh, you know, I, I was always told that turners don't peak till about 50, so I'm not over the hill yet, but I do know this. Time is speeding up. Amen? I got bucked off right, and I'm feeling old. I'm telling you, it's, I'm forcing myself to walk without hobbling, but it, it, uh, it hurts. And it is funny, though, if you, if you are getting bucked on a horse, time slows down to a crawl. <laughs> Amen? I, he was, like, slamming me around for, it seemed like, an hour. Yeah, it was like three seconds, right? Five seconds, whatever it was. But, but time, it, it's going by, and we're getting older, and we know that, and we often comment on how time flies. I think the phenomena, the universal phenomena of us marveling at the reality of time and us traveling through it is, to me, proof positive that God created us for eternity. What I mean by that is it is the universal experience in all of humanity, this thing that we all consistently marvel at. Boy, time sure gets away. Well, that's, that's like a fish saying water is wet. That's our universal experience. Yet, we do marvel at the passage of time because we were created for eternity. I believe that. But this life, this earthly life, is brief. The brevity of time is a fact. It's been said that we will have all eternity to enjoy our victories, but one short day in which to win them. Time is short, and therefore... The Word of God, Old and New Testament, tells us that we are to value. Psalms 90 verse 12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. You see, we've been given a responsibility. If you understand how precious time is and how short it is, then you need to be conscious of your responsibility regarding time. Well, what does he mean when he says... Teach us to number our days. I mentioned the idea of seconds being sensed because most of us are far better at budgeting and keeping track of our money than we are our time. Amen? I mean, none of us would ever waste money the way we waste time. Yet, can I tell you something? You can gain and lose money many times in a moment. But time... You cannot get that back. It is possible to lose money and get it back. You lose time, it's gone forever. So the responsibility we have when David said, teach us to number our days, when Paul says to believers that we are to be redeeming the time, how do we do that? What's he asking us to do as Christians? And how do we do it? Well, first of all, to redeem it means that we have to see the value of it. Redeem is the idea of buying back. We have to understand that there is intrinsic value in the time we're giving, and therefore we have to value it. We have to see the value that God has placed in our hands. The daily, hourly, moment-by-moment -moment opportunity to not just value, but then buy back. That's what redeem means. Buy back. How, how do we do that? I believe we are to be intentionally investing the time God's given us. Do you know the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, 14 through 30? I won't read it, but some of you are familiar with that. The, the man had um, talents, a, a, a landowner there, a, a boss, if you will, and he calls three servants and he gives uh, one uh, five, I think, one two, and one one. And he tells them to invest them. The one that was given a lot, he invested it and doubled his money, if you will. I'm paraphrasing. The other did likewise. But the one that was given the least, he, when called to give an account of what he had done with the master's talent, with his money, he said, I knew you were a hard man. And I, I knew you gather where you don't plant. And therefore, I, I was worried. I was scared. And so I buried it. And you gave it to me. And here it is. The master was wrong. He said, I, I went away. I expected you to invest this talent. You see, I believe when we stand before God, 
I think our greatest regrets, the greatest tears may not be from sins of commission, what we did do that we shouldn't have done, but it may be for this sin of omission failing to redeem the time, failing to take what God gave us and invest it in something that was going to be eternal. This is sobering, and it's hard for us to get our heads around sometimes because, as Paul says, 2 Corinthians 4.18, while we look not at things which are seen, for the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. It's, it's hard in this temporal life to have an eternal mindset, isn't it? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chet mentioned this morning in class that we're bombarded when the world, he mentioned that, you know, tomorrow we're going to be at work or we're going to be, we're not going to be in this church service where the word of God is being preached. And the devil is, listen, very capable of taking our minds away from the things that actually matter. So we must see the value of time and then be intentional about how we invest our time. That's what redeeming means. On a practical note, investing in those around us. What is going to eternity? People are. Amen? Yeah. People are. And can I tell you something? This should change the way you view stuff. Because in America, we have developed, listen, a society where by and large... We use people and we love stuff. And that's wrong. Listen, having stuff may not be a sin, but we ought to use stuff and love people, not the other way around. That's right. Amen? We, we ought to love people. Listen, that's one thing, and I, I'm, I don't want to brag on my dad, but can I just say this? I believe that God has blessed my dad. But can I tell you something? I've also seen that God holds Excuse me, the dad has held God's blessings with a very open hand. We don't, we don't, uh, listen, uh, he mentions that we don't have anything. We're stewards. And, and that's why it's our prayer. Listen, do you know why we, we, we keep steers and we have an arena and we rope? It's not because my kids love to rope. Like it's, Sam does not want to ride a rope. I have to make him, Amen. Not because he wants to. But can I say something? When, when we see that, listen, there's an outlet where we can have people over and listen, yes, we're going to get on and ride and rope, but there's going to be a time where we can fellowship and we can invest the Word of God in people and we can have a time of outreach. Listen, we are to use stuff and to love people. Why? Because people are going to eternity. That's right. Amen? You may say, well, I, I'm roping to try to win a buckle. It'll all burn up one day. Well, I'm, I'm roping to win a, a saddler to get some status. I'm doing this hobby for this reason. Can I tell you something? It's the people around you that matter, not the activity necessarily. Right. Amen. It changes the way you do things when you begin to look at what actually is going to eternity. Use your time for long-term treasure. Use this temporal day, this fleeting life that is a vapor. Use it for something, invested in something that is solid, that is going to last. Because you can't do that. Matthew 6, 20, Jesus said, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where moth and rust can't destroy it. They don't corrupt it. Thieves can't break through and steal it. Do you know that if your heart and your affection, your attention, your time is all invested in the temporal you will be insecure because everything you're investing in can be taken from you. That's right. Amen? That's right. It can be taken from you. But if you invest in the things of the Lord, and you may say, well, well, what is that? Well, listen, it doesn't just mean spending time with people with no purpose. It's talking about investing in people the timeless truth of the Word of God because right. it will last forever. Amen. Amen. It'll right. last forever. Listen, the word of God, the Bible says heaven and earth will pass, but my word will not pass away. Listen, one of the greatest blessings every morning is when I get to get up and I get to see uh, my children with their Bibles open doing their own Bible time. Now, I mean, I know Sam is just trying to get it done. He's going to read through the Bible in a year, and he's not maybe but a day or two behind. Allie and I are a little further behind. Amen? We're just a little further behind than Sam, but our goal is to read through the Bible in a year. Can I tell you something? When we sit around the breakfast table, our, I'll just get a little confession here. We have some pretty bad breakfast practices, I, I admit. 
And it's not Lauren's fault. She, she's got six turners that she's fighting against. Amen? <laughs> because like Isaac and Lucas, if you don't want them to eat it, don't put it in front of them. And so Lauren's trying to fix breakfast for everybody. If it's in front of Luke, it's gone before anybody else is sitting down. And listen, the, she, I didn't get permission to use our breakfast table as an illustration. But listen, the content, quality, nutritional value of our breakfast may vary. But I praise God that, you know what the habit is? Even if I have to be gone at breakfast, we do devotion. And, and listen, I'm not bragging. Please know, if you come to the house, it's not like we're having theological classes. It's sometimes pretty brief. I mean, Sam is a speed reader. When he's in a hurry, sometimes he can read a devotion very fast. And I'm like, whoa, half the breaks. I didn't even catch all that. But you know what is important to me is to instill the timeless Word of God in those little hearts. Because the Word of God will not return void. Listen, I, I preach this message with some conviction on my part because I, I feel there's probably limited value in keeping up with current events, and I sometimes do that, but I'll admit, sometimes I'll get on Lauren's news feed, and it's just one bad story leading to the next. Amen? But it's almost like an addictive circle, and I look down, and I'm like, holy cow, I was just going to check the headlines, and that was 45 minutes ago. And before I checked them, I was feeling great. And now I'm wanting to move to Mexico. I mean, why did I do that? And can I tell you something? Especially in the year 2020, a week from now, the stuff that's making news today will not even be remembered. Amen? I mean, God forbid, hopefully we've had the, the most memorable things happen. But 2020 has been psychotic. Amen? Can I tell you something? If you're trying to build your life on whatever is politically correct or what is going on in the world, you will run yourself ragged. But there is one rock that doesn't change. It's not the sinking sand of today's culture. It is the timeless Word of God. You want to invest in eternity? Invest in the Word of God. Listen, you want to invest in eternity? Invest in those people around you. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, that's what Jesus spoke of. He was speaking to people, listen, who were living in political... Turmoil. Do you realize when Jesus walked the earth, he was in a Jewish family, in a Jewish country that had been conquered by foreign forces? Rome was a present, everyday reality around them. I just say that as Americans, we've been very blessed. And there's some of us that become worried and unsure about the future. I praise God for that last hymn we sang, Have Faith in God, He's on the Throne. Amen. Amen. He watches over His own. He's, he's not going to fail. He will prevail. We can trust God. And as we invest in eternity, let us remind ourselves that this kingdom, this world is not our home. This kingdom we are a part of is eternal. Therefore, as I'm once again Chad, preaching my message this morning, you know that being all fired busy does not necessarily mean you're investing in eternity. Right. Spiritual laziness can take many forms. Listen, investing in eternity means that you prioritize the things that actually matter. Isn't it interesting that God instilled in his moral code, the Ten Commandments, and also before and after that, he established for his people a day of rest, a Sabbath where they think of him, where they depart from their own endeavors, their own pleasures, and they give their time to spending time with the Heavenly Father. So we have a responsibility, and not just a responsibility. My last point this morning is there is a moral necessity of us redeeming the time. Colossians 4, 5, there are texts that walk in wisdom toward those that are without redeeming the time. It's almost as if Paul is saying, and, and in Colossians 4, he's talking about preaching the gospel. That's what he was wanting to do. And he says, walk in wisdom toward those that are without redeeming the time. You know, I think Paul could 
talk to us, he would say, walk in wisdom towards those that are without, those that are, that are not saved, because we're redeeming the time, because time is short. Do you know evangelism opportunity stops at the moment of death? Right. Amen? You know, listen, you got a neighbor, you want to share Christ with them, listen, you better do it now, because you can't do it once they're gone. You can't do it once we're gone. This is why Paul says, be intentional, redeem the time. With There's people that are without. They're without the body of Christ. They're outside of us. They're outside of grace. Walk with wisdom toward them and redeem the time. Listen, he said in Ephesians, redeem the time. The days are evil. Not only is life short, but there is a moral component. There is a good versus evil reality in our world. And the world system is going the wrong way. Listen, 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2, Paul told the young preacher that in the last days, in the last days, perilous times will come. Psalms 37, 18 and 19, he says, The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and they shall not be ashamed in the evil time. The enemy is working every day. That's right. Are you? I don't want to be ashamed when I stand before God. Listen, last night I just thought this was powerful. A friend of mine sent to me an encounter, an evangelistic encounter between Ray Comfort and a couple on the street. I think this was just within the last week or so. He encountered a, an African-American couple, and he said, Hey, can I just ask you a few questions here on the record? And I said, Sure. I'm kind of paraphrasing, but he said, What's the problem in America? First thing one of them said, Racism. And so he broke down racism. You know, white people hate black people. Brown people hate black people. And, you know, Mexicans hate America. And just going through a list, he says, does this sound about right? The guy said, yeah. And he said, what if I told you this is not a skin problem? What if it's a sin problem? And the guy said, well, yeah, you're probably right about that. You know, in about 10 or 15 minutes, he shared God's standard and how we all fall short. He shared the gospel. And this couple, I don't believe it showed that them, him leading them to Christ, but it showed the showed afterwards. He, he led them up to it. I think they cut the camera. He prayed with them to receive Jesus. And he said, now you're my brothers and sisters in Christ. He said, I love you. And the, the man said, my mama's prayer has been answered today. He said, your mom's a Christian. He said, oh, yeah. She's been praying for me. And you know what? As, as we watched this video, it began to become very clear. Listen, do you know that winning political arguments is not what Christians have been called to do? That's right. right. It's That's not right. what we've been called to do. And, and I've heard it said that a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Can I just say this? That, that I'll, I'll be real honest. Because I am saved, because my faith informs my worldview. I am forced many times to side with the quote-unquote conservative side of things just because there's things that, like was mentioned this morning in Sunday school, that are not political, they're scriptural. That's right. I'm not talking about personalities. I'm not talking about a person. I'm talking about certain principles that I cannot escape in the Word of God. That's true, but can I tell you something? No political party will bring a utopia in this life. That's right. right. This temporal life is fleeting, and the Bible says the times, the last days, perilous times are coming, and my hope is not in the government. That's right. Amen? That's right. My hope is in God. And do you know how you invest in eternity? By sharing the gospel with people. Listen, by preaching Jesus. By engaging in a good work, we should be ready to give a reason of the hope that is within us with meekness. Listen, the enemy's working every day. He has a plan. Do you realize the devil, the Bible says that the devil has plans, wiles, the schemes that he's got cooked up? And many of us, we go through life floating along as if we couldn't care less. About what happens tomorrow. What happens to today. I'm simply saying this morning. It is getting darker. Fast. It's time. That we as believers turn on the lights. Amen. It's, it's time to turn on the lights. And, and how do we do that? Listen in Ephesians 5. 
What did Paul, what was the context here when Paul says redeeming the time? Because the days are evil and be not unwise understanding what the will of the Lord is. He starts chapter 5 by saying, saying be, be followers of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. This is Ephesians 5, the same passage where he says redeem the time. He prefaces that with these commands. He says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks for this ye know. That no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Before, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. What's he saying? He's saying, hey... Listen, we're to come out. Do you know that you can't save somebody? You can't be a light to somebody if you are walking in just the same dark manner they are. Right. Right. You can't point people to Christ from this world when you are more worldly than you are Christ-like. And time is short. Listen, we don't have an endless amount of time to get right. right. This is, listen... Yeah, I am, I'm tired of seeing Christians living this life as if it's a practice run. Like we're going to learn and then we get a do-over. No, this is it. That's right. Listen, it's appointed unto man once to die, after that the judgment. That means there's a finish line coming. It's funny, yesterday a friend of mine was telling about when his boys recently ran a 5K race. And he said that one of his boys was, was well ahead. He was, he was going to win. But with about a quarter of a mile to go to the finish line, he starts just walking, bebopping along. And he's, the dad said, I looked behind him, and there were some kids in his group that were coming. They knew the finish line was coming. And he told his son, hey, snap out of it. Take off. The finish line's up there. You can cool it. You can walk after you win. Don't walk now. It's a race. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Listen, what he was saying is time is short. Listen, Christians, I, I see a, a trend. And the trend is that we, in this day and age, seem to be pulling back in areas where we should be pushing forward. Uh -huh. And many believers are getting emotional pushing forward in areas that really may not have any eternal significance. And I'm simply asking if this valuable commodity we've been given, if, if we see time the way God sees it, is there not things in our lives that maybe we should change? You know, we, I was talking to a, a friend recently about, about entertainment, about movies, and he was, he was talking about a, a good movie versus a bad movie. And, and, and I told him, I said, you know, one reason that we just, Lauren and I just haven't got to watch much movies is we don't have time. It has nothing to do with the content. I mean, there's just no time to sit down and say, okay, we're two hours, we're just going to sit on our hindies here. I mean, and, and if you know our kids, trying to watch two hour anything with them is going to get interrupted, amen? And and so it, it's, it's really a time thing. And I'm amazed, listen, when I read the statistics on the young people today, how much quote unquote screen time they spend, <coughs> listen, it blows my mind. Do you realize that you could be a proficient, professional musician on the instrument of your choice, or you could be fluent in any given language if you would just spend half the time on those disciplines as you do on social media or video games. Right. It just blows my mind. It's as if time doesn't matter. As if we're not going to give an account for it one day, but the Bible says we are. See, here's the funny thing. If I blow my money, I mean, Lauren Lauren knows every, she kind of keeps our, our books, so I'm not going to be able to just, I, I mean, I, I, 
I do this sometimes. She'll send me to Walmart for like three or four things. Now, I don't waste a lot of time at Walmart, but here's why. If I walk by and say, hmm, I'm not sure if she wants this or this, just get them both. Right? Like if she'll say, we just need some juice. Well, she was a little too vague, so I come back with every juice that looks cool to me. Right? <laughs> But, but, but my point is, do you know who balances our, our checkbook? It's Warren. And that helps me a great deal because I'm less likely to make a run on all the ammo calibers at the <laughs> sporting goods shelf because I know that when I go back, I mean, $100 is a lot on groceries. It's really nothing on ammo. I mean, ammo's important, right? Amen? <laughs> but it's just hard for me to do that and then give an account and explain to her, Yes, you think I have a lot already, but I needed more. <laughs> Can I tell you something? Knowing that I've got accountability, knowing that there is somebody who's balancing the books, helps the way I spend. It should help, amen? Sure. should help the way I spend. Do you, do you realize we have a loving Heavenly Father? But the Bible says He is going to call us to give an account amen. for what we've been given. And that's, that's, right. that's sobering. That's right. Can I tell you something? There's times... When I'd rather just do nothing. There's times when I'm tired of investing in people. There's times when when I I think better things to do could mean take a hammock, find a shady spot, and disappear for four hours. I mean it. That, but then I also know that I've been given, just let me be practical. Because you say, well, we're not a pastor. We're not in the ministry. You've got a child. You've got a spouse. You've got people around you. And I am very aware that these little blessings God's put in our home. Sammy was 11, getting ready to be 11 years old. That means he's halfway to 20, 22. If my math is right when he turns 11, right? I mean, he's already halfway to 21 years old. And boy, these last 10, 11 years have gone by fast. And can I tell you something? I'll always have a relationship with him. He's my son. But molding him and developing in him things that I know God wants in his life, the window's closing. That's true. The window's closing. That's it. I mean, my, listen, my discipleship window on my children in my home is very, very short. And can I tell you something, parents? That's why, yeah, it's probably easier to do some things without your kids helping you. Amen? Right, it is. It is. Listen, sometimes the kids helping you means it's going to be a lot longer day. Amen? But can I tell you something? I'm raising kids. Right. I need to invest in kids. And, and as my kids get older and they begin to contribute and they begin to learn and listen, they ask questions, why do we do this or what's going on here? And I can invest not just practical things, but I can invest eternal principles in their lives based on the Word of God. I want my kids to know that we go and see people Listen, do you know what it's like to do deathbed visitation on people you're not sure that's saved? To do evangelism in a home where you know that some of the family standing by their loved one is lost? Listen, that's something you pray up about, and you, but it's also something, can I tell you something? I took my kids along with me. This last week, Allie and Tori, I can't remember if Sam, I think Sam, and I think I might have had all of them. Stood and sang, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Amen. to a dying man. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure kids should be involved in that kind of stuff. Can I tell you something? I believe it's an eternal investment. Do you know that if your kids are the very best at the particular sport you enroll them in, that will make very little difference in eternity. Right. Right. But if the young people and parents that you associate with see the light of Christ in your life, that could matter forever. I'm simply saying as I close, let's be practical. Let's be honest and say, God, is there areas in my life where, listen, some of you, you are investing. You've got kids or grandkids that you're pouring into, but sometimes it's easy to get weary in well-doing. Can I just encourage you? The finish line's not here yet. Don't quit running, amen? Right. Don't quit running. The time is short, so let's redeem it. Let's get everything out of this gift called time that God has given us. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, can I tell you something?
time is probably a far more valuable commodity than you can fathom. Because there will be a time when the day of grace is over. Now is the day of salvation. Can I tell you something? The Bible records men who procrastinated a decision for Christ. I read of Paul, whether he's talking to Felix or Festus or King Agrippa, and he is trying to win men to Christ. And you know what the response was? Almost you persuade me to be a Christian. Hey, when I have a better time, I'm going to listen to you later on down the road. He may have, but you know the scripture never records that some of those men ever got a chance to be saved. If you're lost, don't reject Christ. You may say, well, I didn't plan on making a decision. But can I tell you something? If you know you need to be saved and Jesus Christ, listen, the word of God is being preached and the Holy Spirit of God touches your heart, you will make a decision. You're going to trust Christ and confess him as Lord or are you going to reject that? I'm going to ask Miss Kristen to come to the piano. Like I say, my goal, I pray you know this, it, it's not to discourage us. Listen, don't cry over lost time. You know, if we look back, every one of us can regret time that we've thrown away, that we've allowed to slip through our hands. Don't cry, don't waste time mourning lost time. Just begin investing the time God gives you today. Good. Amen? Amen? Just draw a line. Don't worry. You know what the devil would love to do? He'd love to beat you up, make you feel bad for how bad you were. When the Bible says you can put that under the blood, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't waste time crying over lost time. Amen. Let's just begin to follow Jesus. Be followers of God as dear children because the time is short. Let's redeem the time because the days are evil. If you would stand with me with your hands bowed and your eyes closed. Can I tell you something? This this is kind of a, this week has kind of affected me. Let me give you a couple ways. One day I thought <clears throat> You know, I'm going to spend an hour. I'm just going to go run an hour. It's not too hot. Then I had two little girls that were asking me about snow cones, and I decided to go get snow cones rather than kill an hour apart from my kids. That's just one thing that happened. You may say, well, why are you telling us that? Can I tell you something? Some of you dads or maybe even grandparents, you've got young people that are an age where well, right now they want to spend time with couple years, they're not going to want to anymore. Seize the day. Take those opportunities, because can I tell you something? I don't, I don't just get snow cones. We're riding, I talk to them about the Lord. Amen? I ask them, hey, look at that Look at that sunset. Is it, I wonder who made that. Well, God did. I'm just saying, listen, whether it's evangelism, or investing in our children, or discipleship, or putting the Word of God in, I pray today, God has revealed some way that this week you as Miss Kristen plays, this is a time of invitation. You may not be...